My name is Lara Celenza and uh, I'm the founder of an independent production company called uh, Califin Productions in Berlin. Uh, you can look us up online, this is the website. Uh, we mostly make uh, films and music videos and uh, we have recently finished filming our first feature, Lost in the City, uh, which is now in post-production and uh, it will be um, released at the beginning of 2017. Fingers crossed everything goes right. Um, it is an honor for me to be here. I'm a little uh, uh, emotional because uh, I haven't been here in a very long time and uh, I did my master's degree here in 2006-2007. I did a master's in Russian studies with a specialization in Russian and Soviet film. Um, I have very fond memories of this beautiful place and uh, the best thing is that I can be here and hopefully help you. So be of service and give you the information that I didn't have when I started out. So this is of course uh, practical, so it's an emphasis on careers in independent films. So I'm not going to tell you how to write the perfect academic paper because you have of course very eminent professors who can do this much better than I can. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how to land a job within the studio system, so Babelsberg or BBC or Pinewood, you name it. Um, what I'm going to tell you instead is how to set up a team of guerrilla filmmakers, so independent filmmakers, mm. how to produce your own independent film. So if you already have an idea about a project that you would like to develop, this hopefully will be useful to you. Um, also, if you are not interested in directing, but you want to land a job in a, within a production company, at the end I'm going to give you a few tips about how to land a job in independent cinema and maximize your chances of getting an interview. So it's all very practical and uh, everything that I'm going to tell you today is based on first-hand personal experience. So not papers or statistics or anything like that. The way this is structured is I'm going to go through the main difficulties the first time filmmakers encounter when they start producing their own project and uh, I'm going to show you that these difficulties are really uh, mental blocks and they can be overcome and if you have a good idea and you believe in your idea no one and nothing can stop you so you can make a movie even if you don't have industry contacts even if you didn't go to film school even if you don't have fundings because i've made it so anyone can can do that so <laughs> i have no talent this is the most common uh, difficulty that i've encountered uh, among first-time filmmakers mm. It's doubting your own ability to successfully write and direct and produce and distribute your own film. Uh, but it's really based on a misconception because we are content creators working in a very competitive market. And uh, at some point or another, we all find ourselves asking ourselves and other people the big question, you know, like, do I have the talent to, to do this? Do I have the skills? Um, because your family might not support you, for example, mine didn't, and your friends might not understand why you want to do this instead of choosing life and a 9 to 5 job. Um, and you might find yourself discouraged at times, it can happen, it's quite common. But uh, let me tell you two things about talent. The first thing is that it is my firm conviction that we're all talented in one way or another. All of us, and you in this room, are all especially talented because you're here at Cambridge University, so this is the proof that you already have the talent to do this. And uh, the second thing that I want to tell you is that uh, mm. talent is a skill, so it's like a muscle. It develops with time, with training, with patience and with practice. And I have no doubt that each one of you can have a terrific idea for a movie. Um, now, I'm going to say something that might sound a little bit strange, but bear with me. Um, I'm going to say that directing isn't mostly about talent. And uh, by this, I don't mean that talent isn't important, it's very important. But uh, it's not the most important skill that you will need uh, to succeed as a film director. The most important skill, um, the one that's going to make you or break you, is leadership. So. Instead of asking yourself, do I have the talent to be a film director? Examine your kind of personality. Ask yourself if you have leadership skills, if you have that kind of personality. <coughs> because I know plenty of extremely talented people who struggle to find work because sometimes 
they haven't worked on their people skills or they don't have leadership skills. Conversely, I know people who have very good leadership skills and they have a good job in TV and maybe they're less talented than other people. Um, so ask yourself if you're prepared to do whatever it takes. And I'm going to give you like a very quick introduction. So first of all, uh, take full responsibility for whatever happens. Because you're in charge, basically. So if things go wrong, it's, it's your responsibility, even if it wasn't your fault. Um, I'm going to give you a little anecdote, actually, from uh, my, my production experience. Uh, we were shooting a scene of a fight among homeless people. And we were on the street and we had no permits. And uh, what happened is that the actors were so good and the fight was so realistic that they called the police on us. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up facing three police cars and 25 to 30 armed policemen with weapons because they thought something bad was, was happening. So I went there with my very bad German. I had to explain that it wasn't real, that they were actors. And um, I said it was a student project. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily they were really nice and they let us go, they were very understanding. But things could have gone south and if they had it would have been my responsibility, not the other people's. So I would have had to provide papers and explanations and everything. So <coughs> also not just when you're making the film but also when it comes out, if it has a poor reception, like critical reception, then people are going to blame you and it's not professional of you to bounce the responsibility back to the actors or the technicians even if they did a bad job. You don't have to work with them again if you're not happy with what they did, if you don't like the quality of their work. But as far as the project is concerned, you have to protect the image of your team because in independent filmmaking, respect is everything because there's very little money in independent filmmaking. So, if the people who are here with you are here with you, it's not for the money. So it's because they believe in you, they believe in your vision, and they really like the project. Um, but you, as their leader, must be willing to give more than they will ever, ever give to you. And this takes us to the, the next point, which is, am I prepared to work harder than everybody else? Um, on a zero to low budget production, it is absolutely essential to learn to cope with uncertainty. All sort of things can happen. For example, uh, an actor can cancel at the last minute because of uh, poor health or maybe because they got booked on a job that's better paid, it happens. Or um, an outdoor scene, you have to rewrite it for an indoor location because of bad weather or something like that. Or there can be an equipment fail. So I have learned to embrace uncertainty, to live with it, and uh, I plan whatever I can control whilst remaining flexible and happy to find creative solutions on the spot for the things that I cannot control. And I believe that this has made me more focused and also more creative. And you can learn this if you work in the independent uh, arena. Mm, I think even more than within the <coughs> system where everything is carefully planned and you have access to more resources. You're going to have to work very, very long hours. Uh, you're going to have to work a very strange time, sometimes very early in the morning or very late at night. Um, you might even work on Christmas Day or you might miss birthday parties. It works like that. It's, uh, you might end up uh, doing 12-hour shoots sometimes because you go over time or you haven't finished. And uh, sometimes your family and friends, they might not understand you. Like, I can give you an example. Uh, my sister visited me in August in Berlin, and uh, I've seen her about three times. She was in Berlin for a month, and she was wondering whether I'd been kidnapped by aliens, but no, I was in production. And uh, sometimes also another very important thing you have to remember is that you need to have a big, uh, you need to be ready for a massive amount of decision making on the spot, like very quickly. And sometimes after a 12-hour shoot, when people ask me if I want coffee or tea, I don't know what to say. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh no, I'm done. Just give me whatever, water. And people might not always understand why um, you're, you're so tired after production and why it's so demanding. It's, it's a lot of responsibility. 
So I've given you the bad, the bad news, but the good news is that if you are ready to do all of these things, then you will definitely conquer the most satisfying job in the world. I mean, I've done many jobs and, and none of them even remotely compares to directing. It's the most amazing, amazing and satisfying career you can ever imagine. And uh, you have the chance to meet and work with the most inspiring, the deepest people you will ever meet. And um, your life would be an adventure. You will never be bored. The boredom that so many people experience in their working life will be a complete stranger to you. You won't even know what it is. And uh, every shoot is going to be completely different and you're going to love it. And I'm sure about that. You just need to be prepared to face the responsibility and the challenges. But that's true of every career. Um, I'm going to go now through the second uh, difficulty, which is the hardest, I believe, to overcome. And uh, it's I have no time and no money. Um, the mainstream film industry is oversaturated. So basically, I have to, I have to give it to you, like the, the reality of the market. Um, there are not enough paid jobs out there for the enormous amount of candidates. So for any job, there are many, many hundreds of candidates all the time, even at very low levels. So, if you are lucky and you have a wealthy family that can back you up financially, then consider yourself lucky and be grateful for that. But uh, if you're like me and you have bills to pay, then get ready for a bumpy ride. But there are ways to overcome this. Okay, get a day job. That's quite uh, uh, straightforward, right? Uh, I've done everything and anything. Like, I worked in financial publishing in London uh, during the Lehman Brothers crash. That was quite eventful. And uh, <laughs> I worked in uh, marketing. Um, I was a TAFL teacher in Russia for a while, believe it or not, I'm not even a native speaker. And um, um, for a while I was exporting wine and food for a very strange, dodgy company in southern Italy. And, uh, I had to do that. And then I started working as a freelance photographer. So if you're curious, you can check out my photography work. It's my website, laracelenza.com, like my name. Um, mostly I do portrait sessions with actors and musicians and performers and public speakers. Uh, I also do corporate work, so for example product photography catalogs, things like that. I teach photography classes. Um, I have my own home studio in Berlin. Mm. Now, I know that photography is a very popular option for filmmakers when it comes to getting a day job, but personally I wouldn't recommend it because that's another overly saturated market. So it's going to give you many headaches and it will slow down your filmmaking career. So if I could turn back time and do things differently, I would get a mind-numbing job I could quit any time. So for example, shift work is great because it allows you to remain flexible and to book the days off when you're filming. Um, and there is a reason why the stereotype of the actor waiting tables is so popular in Hollywood, because it's true. Um, another option, of course, is to try and find a budget for your film. There are funding schemes and funding avenues available to you. Now, I'm not going to be specific about funding, because it's not my main area of expertise. I advise you to network and to find an experienced producer who can advise you on these things. If you want to find out more, join a filmmaking class on film finance. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. It's a very, very smart option because it's one field that's greatly um, ignored by filmmakers. But unfortunately, it's the most important thing you can learn. Um, I funded my film with um, savings and with services. So. Um, I received a lot of help from my network. I have a very, very big network of people uh, that I've created over the course of the years. And they helped me with free services, props, locations, cash, you name it. Uh, I'm really, really grateful to all these people who helped me. Um, 
and I consider myself really blessed, but it took an enormous amount of time and determination to build that network. So it's not going to be easy, but it's possible. Now we're going to talk a little bit about training, because this is another important uh, thing that many people ask me sometimes, and it's about film school. Should I go to film school? That's a big question. Should I go to film school or not? Um, in my professional life, I've met hundreds of fellow filmmakers, I worked with dozens of them, and I have to say that I've never noticed any big difference in terms of skill set between those who've had formal training and those who haven't. So, for example, also in terms of employment, I know many people who've been to film school and they're working in another area now because they couldn't land a job, and I know people who are self-taught, who are working and working professionals. So. I'm going to give you the brutal, honest truth about film school, and it's the things that people who run film schools will most likely never tell you. Film school is not going to give you some uh, esoteric knowledge that's going to make you a better director. And uh, it's not going to give you a job. Um, now, I'm not trying to discourage you from pursuing further education, because I mean, I'm a big advocate of further education. As you know, I did a master here, and uh, I did also a training course at the Rain Dance Film School. It was a short-term training course for working people. So it's very flexible with the schedule and everything. What I'm saying is that you have to make an informed decision. Before you enroll into film school, make an informed decision. Because it's not going to give you the superpowers. And uh, it can be very expensive. It depends on the school, but normally it's very expensive. So if you want to do it, there are also advantages to enrolling into film schools. Film schools have access to good cameras, good equipment, lights, sound stages. Uh, they have a network of actors. They organize networking events. So they're going to help you move forward. But they want to give you a job, and probably they want to give you fundings. So my advice, if you want to do it, do it. But do it for the love of learning, because you love it. Don't do it because you have expectations about it. Um, if you can't afford it or you don't want to do it, there are some alternative options available to you. I'm going to um, walk you through those. One thing you can do is to join lectures and seminars run by famous directors. So if you really have to learn, learn from the best. I've recently found out, for example, that there is one uh, run by Ferner Herzog online. Um, and it's about $90 or something, and um, it's got videos and teaching materials, and this is, I think, very useful. I haven't taken it yet, but I will because I'm too curious. Um, another thing you can do is take a course in specific skills that are actually sought after in the industry. So you can get a paid job and get some experience. For example, film financing, as I said before, but we will talk about it a bit later. Another thing you can do, you can join a short-term course. Uh, I went to the Raindance Film School, for example. It's in London, and it's run by Elliot Grove. He's the director of the Raindance Film Festival. And uh, they offer short-term, hands-on, affordable training courses. I took a directing diploma, I believe it was called, and uh, I'm very happy with it. I had very good teachers and I learned everything I needed to know in order to produce my first short. And it was about three months and I believe I remember only evenings and weekends or something like that. So you can work at the same time. So this is one recommendation, but of course you can do your own research. There's many more available out there. Okay, now we're going to talk about another issue, which is unfortunately very common. Writer's block. Because many of us have to write their own material, or they, we feel if we don't want to work with an external screenwriter, we might end up writing our own film. And the industry is actually encouraging um, directors who can write. So if you're a writer-director, you have better chances. Um, so let's say you have this great idea for a movie. And, uh, Obviously, the first thing you would do is develop the initial idea into a, a logline first. So first you do a logline, and then you do a treatment, and then from the treatment you develop a screenplay. But let's say that for any reason you are stuck, or you get into the habit of procrastination, um, 
you stare at your computer screen and you don't know, you, you feel like you're not moving forward. Now, personally, I've never experienced writer's block, but I know many talented people who have, and I know that there are ways to overcome it easily. First of all, you can read books on screenwriting to familiarize yourself with the genre and with the techniques used by famous screenwriters. For example, again, <laughs> I'm not working for them, but I'm recommending them. Um, this book by Elliot Grove, it's called Rain Dance Writer's Lab, Write and Sell the Hot Screenplay. Uh, I found it very useful, it's very practical, it's going to give you some tips, not just on writing the script, which is fair enough, fair enough, but also how to pitch it and how to present it to media boards, to production companies, it's very useful. There are many more books out there, you're very smart, you're Cambridge students, so do your own research, find a few books, and my advice is not to read too many. So maybe read one or two and absorb some of the techniques and use them for your writing. And uh, come up with your own ideas. Mm, there is no right or wrong in screenwriting. So whatever works for you is going to be good for you. Then, again, learn by the best. So read the screenplays of your favorite movies. There's this couple of websites, uh, the first one I think is called the uh, um, Internet Movie Script Database and then there's uh, simplyscripts.com. You can read and download screenplays for free online. Um, now this is very important. When you read the scripts, learn about the formatting. Um, the formatting is very important when you submit your film to a producer, to a production company, to a media board. You would be surprised how many of these scripts get rejected, not because they're not good, but because they, they don't show the proper formatting. So make sure you pay attention to the details, to these kind of things. And then, again, join a local screenwriting uh, workshop or course. It's always good to get some feedback from teachers, from students, but my honest advice to you, listen to them, but don't listen too much. Believe in yourself, have faith in your idea. And then, this is the best advice that I can give you when you're stuck with your writing. Um, and it's uh, to find a co-writer. Who says that write, writing should be this solitary endeavor? Actually, co-writing is becoming extremely popular, uh, especially in the development of TV series. They have big writing teams. And TV series now sets the standards, in many cases, in terms of narration, in terms of experimenting. So, um, Find a friend who's got a similar taste in film and uh, set deadlines for each other, encourage each other, give each other feedback and discuss and write together. For example, when I developed the, the character for my feature film, it started from suggestions from my lead actor. He came to me and he said, oh, I have this idea for a character. There is this character who lost everything and he's living on the streets and he's uh, deranged and he's lost it. And then he sent me some notes, and from that we discussed it, we did brainstorming sessions, and we developed the character, which ended up to be a full screenplay. Now, this is going to sound a bit strange, but uh, I think it's the best thing you can do also when uh, you feel stuck. Distract yourself creatively. So if you're stuck, engage in a hobby that's going to get your creative juices flowing. It doesn't have anything to be with filmmaking. It can be something else, like gardening or martial arts, whatever. Um, the ideas will flow naturally, with no resistance. For example, I use meditation, and David Lynch uses meditation. So if it works for him, it can work for us. Um, don't be fixated on the writing. Get out of the room, get back into the room. Um, I was shouted at because I bought an extra banana at the supermarket, and they didn't like that. And when the video came out, I found out that I hadn't even been credited for my work. So, that wasn't very glorious as a beginning, but I learned a lot. Um, I learned the importance of acknowledging the hard work and the dedication of your cast and crew. So when you are directors, when you do your thing, your project, your movie, remember to credit the people who worked for you and to give them showreel material, portfolio material, possibly IMDb mentions, and references if you're happy with what they did and you want to help them. Um, it's always a good idea to get some experience on other people's projects before embarking on your own. 
uh, but this is easy. So this one is very, very easy to overcome, and I'm going to give you some practical tips. Ask your filmmaker friends to help out. We all do it. We all help, even at high level, people do it. Um, look for opportunities on local filmmaking groups. For example, on Facebook, there's many of, uh, local filmmaking groups for people network. And you can browse the professional websites where people run cast and crew calls. So, mandy.com, filmandtvpro.com. I will give you a more comprehensive list later of all the resources that we use. Um, you can find a project that you like, that tickles your fancy, and then you can apply, but be ready for a bumpy ride. So, now, we're going to talk about another important issue, which is connections. It is a well-known fact in the industry that filmmaking isn't about what you know. Okay, nobody cares about that. Filmmaking is about who you know. Now, if you're lucky enough to start off with the right connections, then you don't even need to be here. Get out and make your movie and use your connections to get visibility. Okay? When I started, I didn't have one single connection with one single person who was working in film. Um, when I arrived in Berlin three years ago, I had no job and no money, and I didn't speak a word of German apart from beer and currywurst. So, for three years, I built up my network, collaborating, helping out on set on other people's projects, um, exchanging business cards, looking, going to screenings, and these kind of things. Mm. What I did have at the time, I already, have some, I already had some assets when I arrived in Berlin. Your assets, when you don't have money, you don't have connections, are, first of all, your good reputation and work ethics. So, credit people, give them showreel material. They will be happy to work with you. And second, once you've done your first project, prepare a package, and this package is going to be your website, your showreel, your portfolio, mm -hmm. your festival attendance record, any awards that you want. This is going to build up your reputation. Now, how do I build up this network from scratch? I'm going to give you some very simple to follow practical tips. So join uh, local filmmaking groups, go to festivals, screenings and events, make sure you have your business card in your pocket. Um, if you're shy or an introvert like me, it's not the end of the world. You can network online. For example, Facebook is full of filmmaking groups and even seasoned professionals, I can assure you, they use it. If you're a photographer, as well, other than being a director, it's always a good idea to offer a headshot service to actors, dancers and performers. It's also a fun way to work with them, to get to know them, to get to know their personality and decide which ones you want to work with in the future. Um, ask your non-filmmakers friends to help you. The fact that they might not understand your choices doesn't mean they don't want to be a part of it. You'll be surprised how much help you're going to get from your friends because they are curious about what you do and they want to support you. Um, and this is, in my opinion, the most important. It's you have to help promote your fellow filmmakers' work. Share it on social media, go to your friends' events and collaborate. So be collaborative. Um, for example, let's say that your actor friend did a theater play, a thought-provoking piece of theater, share it on social media, go to see the, the show. Or, for example, let's say that your photographer friend really needs a tripod, lend him the tripod, and next time he's going to help you out. This always works. It is a sort of an assumption that the industry is like this um, tiny pond and we are sharks swimming in it, but it doesn't have to be like that. Actually, it, I personally believe that success and recognition comes to the people who are not afraid to support other people. So, mm, it also shows that you have confidence in your work, in your vision, in your project. You're not afraid, you don't see other people as a threat, you see them as a resource. This is very important. So, in my experience, the most successful people I know are the people who choose a collaborative attitude over a competitive attitude. So, help others and collaborate. Um, now, we're going to talk about the technical things now, very briefly. So, the equipment, I have no equipment. Now, in the old days, when there was film, that would have been really hard to overcome. But uh, we are lucky because we live in the digital era now. 
uh, which has made filmmaking much more accessible. Once it was a profession or a pastime reserved only to the extremely wealthy, now it's available to everybody. And I really love film. And if I will be given a chance, I will definitely shoot my feature, my next feature on film. But I have to say that the DSLR has made filmmaking accessible. And now, even if filmmaking remains, um, the equipment remains still relatively expensive, there are avenues available to you if you want to shoot low budget. For example, you can uh, contact a rental house, uh, rent the equipment. We all do it. Um, many of these rentals offer weekend packages. So you pick up the equipment on a Friday, you return it on a Monday and you can save money. Most of them are run by young aspiring filmmakers, so they're very nice, they're going to help you out. Then, hire a competent cinematographer. This is important because a very competent cinematographer is going to have the know-how to make your film look really good even if you don't have a big budget. Especially if they have their own equipment, that's going to save you money. Especially if they're used at working with available lights. So you don't have to hire those, at least when you start. And then, if you cannot afford to rent the equipment, you cannot afford to hire a cinematographer, shoot with a DSLR or even with an iPhone. Um, I have friends who shoot films uh, on an iPhone with anamorphic lenses mounted on it. And they look pretty decent, they look acceptable. Uh, I shot my feature on a DSLR, on a Canon 6D, so it's a relatively inexpensive professional camera. And I shot monochrome. And that's because I, I love black and white artistically and it, it was telling the story because it's a story of a homeless guy, homelessness and injustice. So you have like a very strong contrast between the black and the white. So I felt it was telling the story. But part of it was also because my camera is really, really good in monochrome. So I was getting better value for my money. You have to know your equipment really well. You have to maximize what you can get from your equipment. Now, this is also very important, hire a good sound recordist. I can never stress that enough. If you can't, be prepared to dub and fully your film, because the audience, if the footage is not so great and they love the story, they might forgive you, okay? But if the sound is bad, they won't, because bad sound makes the film very hard to follow and uh, it's very distracting. It can destroy your project. So make sure you pay attention to that. And then, of course, there is the very famous uh, assumption that we have, well, don't worry, we can fix it in post. Many things you can fix in post, it's true. Uh, bad image quality, sometimes even sound, you can fix to an extent. So if you learn how to use an editing software, that's going to be really good for you or collaborate with an experienced editor. This is also another option. For example, I use Premiere. Uh, you can use Final Cut, you can use Avid. There are many softwares out there. And uh, they will greatly improve the quality of your project if you're a good editor. And now, this is the most important tip I can give you today. Forget the equipment altogether, okay? and focus on the heart of your film, so give it your undivided attention. So your aesthetics, your framing, uh, the performance, the flow, the energy that the actors have, uh, the atmosphere. Mm, this is why we watch movies in the first place, because we love the journey of self-discovery. It's not because, oh, it was shot on a red or it was shot on an Alexa. You know, this is the most important thing, so pay attention to that. And even if you don't have a big budget, you can produce something pretty decent that people will love. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about actors. I believe we have one in the room, but I'm not going to tell you where. <laughs> and uh, we've already discussed contacts, okay? So I'm going to go through this very briefly. I'm just going to add a few tips and resources for you to find actors and to work with them. Ideally, you want to work with a casting director or an agency. But if you can't, this is what you do. Visit local theatres, acting schools, or rehearsal spaces, uh, UK too. Casting Call Pro, UK, Star Now UK, Modern Mayhem too, it's international. 
um, it's for models, but you can also use it for actors. Crew United, it's only in Germany, I don't know if it could be useful to you. Also, if you want to reach more people, you can use Facebook or LinkedIn or Craigslist or the Gumtree. When you post your casting call, the more information you can add, the more professional it's going to look. So be very specific. Specify the role, uh, gender, playing age, pay, if any, uh, the shooting dates and the specific skills that are required for the role. So for example, I don't know, martial arts or boxing or whatever. Now, there is uh, an option of running an audition. If you can't afford to run an audition for any reason, you can also use video casting, which is uh, increasingly popular, even uh, with the big TV series. They now do it, mostly for agencies. Video casting is flexible, it's more affordable, and it's good to make a first selection, but I think it's always better to audition people in person. Always better. When you work with actors, be a perfectionist. So, you will find out that it's not easy, okay? But whenever you can, please, make time for readings, character development workshops, rehearsals, and test shoots. Because actors, sometimes they feel that they are, what can I say, treated superficially by directors. Especially when they do a lot of commercials or cheap TV. So they will greatly appreciate your dedication, they will greatly appreciate your attention to details. So all the time that you spend with them is going to be well spent, time well spent. And not only they will repay you with great performance, they will also recommend you to other actors. And so you can grow your talent base. And also, I think that like a good relationship with actors is very precious. We must cultivate it with care. It's very important. Because they are the heart of the film at the end. It's not the camera you use. OK, so let's say now that you've made this beautiful independent film, you want to distribute it. So you want to get it out there. Basically, you have a film without an audience. It's like uh, if you have a Lamborghini and you keep it in the garage. OK, so you want to get it out. When people talk about distribution, usually in the independent world, they refer to the festival circuit, okay? Um, why? Why is it so important to go to a festival? There are three main reasons, and they're there. So to expose your film to acquisition executives, hopefully you can sell your film, to get reviewed and interviewed and create buzz, and hopefully to win awards. These are, I'm going to go through this very, very briefly, okay? I'm just going to give you some basic. Um, there are five different types of, of film festivals. There's the majors. I don't have to tell you why they are important, and it is our first objective to attend these. Cannes, Toronto, Sundance, Berlinale, Rotterdam, and Venice. The mini majors um, are maybe a little bit less prestigious, but they're very, very good launching platforms for your film. Sometimes they tend to have uh, to give priority to very original material, so they're excellent. South by Southwest and Locarno, San Sebastian, Raindance, Tribeca, and Carlo Vivari. Uh, the city festivals are nice because they attract local press, but usually the film executives don't really visit those, not too often. But they're very good, they're very interesting. In the UK, for example, I'm, uh, I'm giving you the, the most important in the UK because it's more useful to you. So Edinburgh, Leeds, London, and of course the Cambridge Film Festival, which I believe runs in October. And then you have the genre film festivals. Now, if you make a horror film or you make a science fiction or a children movie, there's many genre film festivals out there that specialize in a specific genre. And uh, they are very good because they have a hardcore film base of uh, fans who love the genre. They're going to follow you, they're going to come to the screening. So they're very vibrant, they're very dynamic. Um, then you have, of course, the independent. Now, the independent can be very good, they can be very bad. So my advice to you, before you pay any submission fee to an independent film festival, first of all, make sure they have a real screening. Some of them are online, and you, you might find it out afterwards. And I wouldn't recommend those. Then, uh, read the reviews, talk to previous year's attendees, and ask them about their experience at the festival. I'm going to give you some personal favorites. Mm -hmm. This is just from my personal experience. So, uh, 
some festivals that I've experienced that were very nice. The first one is the International Crime and Punishment in Istanbul. It's for films with a sort of social rights, um, social angle. And it's run by the Faculty of Law at the university. And it's very, very, very well organized. Then there's a new media film festival in Los Angeles, uh, which specializes in storytelling, but also new forms. So web series, uh, 3D, 360 degrees, you name it. They love these kind of new things. And then there's a Oaxaca Film Festival in Mexico, uh, which, well, it's Mexico. Do I have to tell you why it's, it's really good? It's a beautiful place, and it's like a family. So you get to meet all the other directors and you get to hang out with them and explore this beautiful place. And they have very good screenwriting workshops for writers. So I went there not as a director, I went there as a writer. And I found the lessons very informative. Okay, before you submit to film festivals, make sure you understand the premiere status requirements of your festival of choice. Because some festivals, especially the majors, only accept international premieres and sometimes national premieres. When you submit, have a press kit ready. It's this package that I wrote there. So this is the, the most common information they're going to ask for. So a poster of the film, a log line, which is a very synthetic uh, description of what your film is about. A synopsis, which is a bit longer. Trailer, stills credits, the director's statement, which is basically your vision, and uh, backstage photos and contact details. Whenever you can, if you can, outsource the distribution, so you can contact the distribution agency. The advantages are obvious. First of all, it's going to save you headaches, because submitting to film festivals is a job, and it's a lot of work. And number two, a distribution agency, they have the know-how, okay? So they watch your film and they already know which festivals are appropriate for your film. So they know which festivals to apply to and get more chances of getting in. So it's good. Number three, it always looks more professional when the film is coming from an agency than when the film is coming from an individual. For example, in Germany there's a very good one called Augen O Medien. And uh, there's a Paris-based agency called the Festival Agency. You might want to look it up. They store your digital files and uh, they manage the payment. So you don't have to go through the motions every single time. You just submit it once and then you prepare everything and then you click and you pay and that's it. These are uh, the ones that we use, but there's many more. But you might want to uh, take a note. It's without a box. Short film Dagot, of course, for short films, and Film Freeway, Festival, and Real Port. There's always new ones coming up. It's very popular. So, let's say now that your film has uh, done the festival circuit and you want to market it more, but you're a bit worried because you believe that you don't have marketing knowledge, okay? The truth is that nobody does. <laughs> I've met many people who studied uh, film marketing at university and uh, distribution and this, and they have no clue. So um, <laughs> it's something you can only learn with your experience, okay? And besides, this is a market that changes continuously. So what you learn today, you must unlearn tomorrow. So I'm not a marketing expert, okay? So what I'm going to do is share with you what I know, and then you can do your research and you can improve on that. The first tip I can give you is to run a crowdfunding campaign. There is a general assumption that crowdfunding, the main purpose of a crowdfunding campaign is to fund production, fund post-production. But the truth is that unless you have a famous actor on board, or you have a big brand, or you have a viral concept, it's going to be very hard for you to raise a large amount of money for funding. However, what a crowdfunding campaign can do for you is create an audience, okay? So all the people, the friends, the relatives, the total strangers who purchased the perks and the gadgets through the crowdfunding campaign, they will be dying to see your film, they will be curious. So you're going to have an audience. By the time the film comes out, you're going to be ready to show it to them. So it's really good. 
try the platforms like Indiegogo, I just wrote a few, Kickstarter and Patreon. Then, of course, you want to get creative, you want to organize events to get people to come and see your film. Before the festival circuit, don't do anything, okay? Maybe a private cast and crew screening, and that's it. After the festival uh, circuit has been done, you can uh, organize the screenings at cinemas, you can screen at charity events if your film has a social angle. Uh, you can join group screenings with other filmmakers. For example, in London there is a very interesting platform, it's uh, Shorts on Top. It's for short films. Um, they organize also events in London, in Berlin, and I believe also in other places, and you might want to look them up, that's good. Use social media. This is a list of the social media that we use at the moment, but uh, you can use more social media platforms if you're happy with them, and uh, post uh, backstage photos and your articles or your interviews and trailers and teasers and updates, create Facebook events. Uh, if you have something viral, like a stunt or something like that, that's great, that's going to attract attention. Build a website specific for your film, that's also a very popular option. Especially if you want to submit it to a producer. You can build a website even if you haven't made the film yet, with your poster art, with your statement, with your trailer, or whatever, and uh, send it to prospective producers. The most popular platforms, I believe, for low-budget films, so independent films, are WordPress and Tumblr. Uh, there is this uh, more obscure option, but I recommend it to you because it's very nice. It's called XPRS uh, Site Builder. And uh, it's a bit buggy here and there, but I like it because it's pleasing aesthetically. And when you promote video, image is everything, so it has to look nice. Um, and then the most important thing is network. So word of mouth, it's the oldest, but it's always the most effective. Word of mouth is going to help you the most. So network and talk to people. Okay, so um, now we talked about how to make your own film. And if you have questions, you can also ask me at the end. If you want to hear something more specific about um, the, the, the production process, you can ask me. Before we uh, move to Q&A, I just want to quickly um, sink my teeth in another topic. That is, let's say you don't want to direct because you think it's, uh, you're not interested or you want to work for a production company, you want to do something else. Um, so I'm going to quickly give you a few tips, okay, from personal experience. And uh, it's going to sound a bit brutal, but you have to hear it. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. I wish I had known these things when I started. I had nobody telling me these things and I wasted so much time and I don't want you to waste any time. I want you to just skip all of that and go to the fun part, okay? So if you want to apply for a production company, acquire a technical skill that the industry actually needs. I'm talking, I'm not trying to discourage you from being a writer, hear me out. I'm just saying if you want to apply for jobs, these are the jobs that are not available, okay, if you don't know anybody. Writing, directing, photography, cinematography, almost every single videographer I know is either unemployed or struggling. It's very hard. The industry looks for sound recordists, makeup artists specialized in prosthetics, editors specialized in visual effects, and so on. Now, this is another tip I can give you. If you can, invest in drone technology, study that. Because I think that in a few years' time, the drone operators are going to be the camera operators and the steady cam operators of the future. So now it's still a bit expensive, it's quite expensive. But I think it's gonna change. And I think that if you, if you become an expert on that, you're gonna have a good job. So look into that. If you want to go a bit more general, uh, become a producer. So learn about film finance and uh, marketing, contracts, budgeting, scheduling. You might think, oh, but that's, that's the boring stuff, but it's not, because it's, it's, it's very important. Behind every successful film, there is a very, very successful, very smart, very ambitious, very hardworking producer who did all this stuff, and it's very hard to find this kind of people in the industry, especially at an independent level. 
when you apply, when you write the covering letter, for the love of God, don't use the word filmmaker. Uh, I've never heard of a single production company looking for filmmaker, and don't tell them what a great artist you are because they are interested in specialized skills. So state briefly what your specialized skill is, and add the link to your portfolio or samples of work. Write a short covering letter. If you don't have any specialized skills, you can try your luck as a videographer or photographer, but get, be ready to work for peanuts for many difficult years. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying this is your destiny, I'm saying it's a possibility, okay? I don't want to discourage you, but it's harder, much harder. Another alternative, you can apply for a runner or assistant position. It's maybe not very glamorous, but it's very important. A good assistant is golden in the industry, and you're going to learn a lot. Now, freelancing. So you might want to do your own thing. Instead of working for a production company, you want to freelance. That's what I do. It's hard. It's very, very hard. And if you want to run a freelancing business, invest in expensive specialized equipment or get a studio. And when you um, are in contact with prospective clients, don't forget to send them your equipment list and the pictures of your studio. Why am I saying that? Because it's going to give you an edge over the competition. The freelancing is extremely competitive. It's crazy, okay? It's very, very hard. So you have to have something that other people don't have. So if you have a very good camera and an excellent show reel, or you have a big studio with a green screen, that's going to give you an edge over everybody else. But most importantly, this is the most important thing, okay? This is the most important thing. You, you, sh you should never, ever, ever consider giving up, ever. Because this is an industry that rewards persistence. And uh, very often, it rewards persistence over talent, okay? So never give up, be persistent. Because if you're, if you're good at what you do and you keep going, eventually um, you will have a chance to, to, to make your talent shine through. You will get an opportunity. I can promise you that. I could afford to have existential problems back then. Now? Now it's all about chances. Chance to take a piss in peace. Chance to steal a half-smoked cigarette. A chance to drink myself unconscious. And most importantly, the chance to reach that state of bliss when I'm so comatose that I can't tell a pussy from a paper bag. Cheers, pal.